15 minute or less lecture series, Human Anatomy, Chapter 11, Muscular System, Part 1. Muscles attach to bones usually. The origin is where the muscle attaches, but there should be little to no movement. The insertion is where the muscle attaches, and there should be movement. Usually the muscle then has to cross a joint, and the movement occurs at the joint. Turns out some muscles can cross more than one joint. Some are capable of a reverse muscle action. They can flip the insertion and origins. And muscles tend to insert into bone, but sometimes they can insert into themselves or into skin. Uh, lever systems, physical con physics concept that uh, relates to muscles. So the muscle is generating force or effort. That is what the contraction is doing. <laughs> the levers of a lever system is the bones themselves. The fulcrum is the uh, joint where the movement is occurring. And the load is whatever being moved part of the body or something, say, on or being held by that part of the body. Uh, mechanical advantage is when the load is closer to the fulcrum than the effort. And... This overall means that you can use less energy to uh, move that object. Mechanical disadvantage means the load is further away from the fulcrum than the effort, and this would require more energy to move the load. Uh, there are three kinds of lever systems. The first class lever systems, where the fulcrum is between the effort and the load. It, for example, is with the um, splenius capitis muscles moving the head at the uh, uh, occipital lantern joint. That is an example of a uh, First-class lever system in the body. It also works uh, as a seesaw type structure. This is either uh, advantage or disadvantage. Second-class lever systems, uh, such as with the gastrocnemius attached to the calcaneus bone, causing the movement where the tibia contacts the talus or the ankle. Uh, this is a second-class lever system. Uh, wheelbarrow will be another example of that, and it is always an advantage, a mechanical advantage. And then the third class lever system, the most common, where the uh, effort, the muscle attachment, is between the fulcrum and the load, such as fishing. And this is always a mechanical disadvantage. The reason why our body chooses this is because it allows for a larger range of motions and quicker response. Arrangement of fascicles. Fascicles within a muscle organ can be arranged in different orientations. They can be parallel, all flat, and going in the same direction. They can be fusiform, where they sort of taper at the ends, but are thick in the middle where the muscle belly is. They can be circular, where they insert into themselves, forming a circular structure. They can be triangular, where they're spread out and then come toward one single thick tendon, such as the deltoid muscle. Or they can be a pinnate, where you have a long tendon that the fascicles are connecting to. It can be a unate pinnate, they're all attached to the same side, a bipendent, where they're attached to either side of that tendon, or a multipendent, where you have many bipendents all coming together in one thick tendon. Uh, muscle names include where the muscle is found, such as uh, gluteus maximus, the gluteal region, by the shape, such as trapezius, or shaped like a trapezoid, relative size of muscles, maximus, minimus, uh, direction of the fascicles, are oriented toward the midline, such as rectus along the midline, the location of attachment, hyoglossal, the hyoid bone and the tongue, number of origins, biceps two, triceps three, or the action, flexor, pronator, supinator, etc. cetera. Uh, coordination, it turns out that we often think of the muscles as working in opposing groups. We have the primary mover that is contracting, getting shorter to cause the movement at the joint, and the antagonist, which is going to be relaxing and stretching to allow for that movement to occur. So for instance, here, if we're flexing at the elbow, the biceps brachii is the prime mover, while the triceps brachii is the antagonist relaxing a lot to occur. Other muscles will aid in these sort of movements, synergists and fixators, which help to aid the primary mover, keep a stable movement that's under control. Okay, muscles that move the scapula include the uh, pectoralis minor, the pectoralis minor, it has its origin on ribs three through five and inserts into the coracoid process of the scapula. It will then protract the scapula, pull it forward, and also depress it, pull it down. We have the serratus anterior muscle. Its origins are ribs one through eight. It inserts into the medial border of the scapula. This allows it to protract or pull forward the scapula as well as superiorly rotate the scapula, turn it so that it's uh, distal, uh, inferior angle is moving toward the lateral direction. Uh, then we have the trapezius. This is a huge muscle on the upper back region. It inserts 
into the scapula. It helps to levitate and superiorly rotate the scapula. It can also retract or pull back the scapula, and it can depress the scapula. The reason why it's able to both elevate and depress opposing movements is because it doesn't have to contract completely. It could just have the superior region contract to pull it up, elevate it, or just the inferior region contract to pull it down, depress it. Muscles don't have to completely contract. Also have the levator scapulae. This muscle's origin is in the transverse process of C1 through 4, and it inserts into the superior part of the medial border of the scapula. It helps to elevate the scapula and inferiorly rotate it. Rotate it so its inferior angle is going towards the midline. Uh, we have the rhomboid minor and rhomboid major. They both help to elevate and retract the scapula or pull it back. Uh, they also help to inferiorly rotate the scapula, pull it toward the midline. Uh, we have pectoralis major. It is a muscle that moves the humerus, has a broad origin on the clavicle, costal cartilage of ribs two through six, body of the sternum, and inserts into the greater tubercle of the humerus, allowing us to flex the arm at the shoulder, to adduct it, and to medially rotate. We have the coracobrachialis muscle going from the origin down the uh, coracoid process of the scapula, inserting to the medial shaft of the humerus. Uh, that helps to adduct and flex the arm at the shoulder joint. We also have the teres minor and teres major. Teres minor, teres major. They Teres minor adducts and laterally rotates the arm at the shoulder. The teres major adducts and medially rotates the arm at the shoulder. Slight difference in what they do. So we have latissimus dorsi, this huge sheet-like muscle on the lower back that inserts into the humerus. It helps to extend the arm as well as adduct and medially rotate the arm. Wow, it's huge. Then we have the subscapularis muscle. Subscapularis, its origins, the subscapular fossa, the scapula, it serves into the lesser tubercle of the humerus, helps to medially rotate the arm. Then we have the supraspinatus muscle. That's origin is the supraspinous fossa of the scapula. It inserts into the greater tubercle of the humerus and it will abduct the arm. And then we have the infraspinatus muscle. Its origin is the infraspinous fossa of the scapula. It inserts into the greater tubercle of the humerus, and it adducts and laterally rotates the arm. And then we have the deltoid muscle, this large muscle on the shoulder. Its origin is the acromion end of the clavicle, the acromion and spine of the scapula. It inserts into the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. It can flex and medially rotate the arm. It can abduct the arm. It can also extend and laterally rotate the arm. Again, it is able to do opposing movements because the entire muscle doesn't have to contract at once. You can have either the anterior region contract for the flexing and medially rotating, or the posterior region contracting for the extension and laterally rotating of the arm. Moving on to muscles that move the forearm. This includes the biceps brachii. The biceps brachii has two origins, the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula and the coracoid process of the scapula. It inserts into the radial tuberosity of the radius. It crosses two joints, so it flexes the arm at the shoulder. It also flexes the forearm at the elbow and also helps to supinate the forearm. Then we have the brachialis muscle. Its origin is the distal anterior surface of the humerus. It inserts into the coronoid process of the ulna and it helps to flex the forearm at the elbow. Then we have the brachioradialis muscle. It flexes the forearm. Its origin is the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus above the lateral epicondyle and inserts into the styloid process of the radius. Uh, then we have the triceps brachii. This has three origins, the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula, the posterior humerus above the radial groove, and the posterior humerus below the radial groove, and it inserts into the olecranon of the ulna. It helps to extend and adduct the arm at the shoulder and extend the forearm at the elbow. Uh, then we have the supinator, a very deep muscle that also crosses the uh, uh, elbow joint and will supinate the arm. Then we have the pronator teres, a muscle that helps to move the forearm. Pronator teres origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus and the coronoid process of the ulna and inserts into the lateral surface of the radius and helps to pronate the forearm. Then we have the flexor carpi radialis. Its origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus and inserts into the base of the metacarpals two and three. Helps to flex the wrist and abduct the hand. Uh, pulmonaris longus, a Muscle that's origin is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. It inserts into the palmar aponeuroses, a connective tissue structure, and it's a weak flexor of the wrist. Then we have the flexor carpi ulnaris. 
very medial muscle. It origins in the medial epicondyle of the humerus, as well as the olecranon of the ulna. It inserts into the pisiform and hamate bones, as well as the base of metacarpal fibe. It flexes the wrist and adducts the hand. Uh, we also have below those muscles, the flexor digitorum superficialis. It flexes the wrist and also flexes fingers two through five. And then below that, even deeper, is the flexor digitorum profundus, which flexes the wrist and flexes the fingers two through five. Then flipping over to the posterior side of the forearm, we have the uh, extensor carpi radialis longus. Its origins the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus above the lateral epicondyle. It serves into the base of metacarpal two. It helps to extend the wrist and abduct the wrist. Then we have the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It inserts into the base of metacarpal three, and it helps to extend the wrist and abduct the hand. Then we have extensor digitorium. This muscle's origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It inserts into the distal middle phalanges of fingers two through five, and it helps to extend the wrist and extend fingers two through five. Then we have extensor digitimianomy. Its origin is also the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It inserts into the proximal phalanx of finger five, helps to extend finger five, and also weakly extend the wrist. And then we have uh, at the medial side, the extensor carpi ulnaris. Extensor carpi ulnaris is origin, the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It inserts in the base of metacarpal five. It helps to extend the wrist and adduct the hand. Uh, we also have these two smaller muscles that are just there for the thumb. The extensor pollicis longus helps to extend the thumb and weakly extend the wrist. And you have the abductor pollicis longus that helps to abduct the thumb and weakly extend the wrist. And that's it for this one.